the movie? Yeah, there's a movie called Ragamuffin. Is it really? All right. Let's see if I got a good. It didn't record last time. All right. Well, Al, Al said, could I, could I mention something about the Adamic Covenant? Uh, I don't know if I should do that and make the ladies all happy and the guys mad. Maybe that's his problem. But if you go back and look in Genesis, and you'll see that God says specifically to Adam, Adam, you, you shall not eat of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. And then, then Eve was created. Now, the way we always take it is, well, Eve is, came out of man. But that's not the way the Orthodox Jews, and that's not the way the Bible takes it. Women is, woman is the peak of creation. She's the greatest and final creation by God. And God did not tell her. Adam told her, don't eat of the tree of good and evil, right? But she was a fully cogent, separate being from God. She did not have to follow, or from, from man, she did not have to follow what is called the Adamic covenant. The Adamic covenant said that God said to Adam, but not to Eve. Now, it depends on how you want to look at the world. If you're a Puritan, you look at the world that woman is simply a something under man, but that's not what the Bible says at all. We know that the Bible, you know, for example, I've told you before, the Kafela verses, that talks about man, you know, uh, Christ, uh, God is ahead of Christ, is Christ ahead of man, is man is ahead of Gune, of his wife, which, that's not what it says at all in the Greek. In Greek, the word Kafela doesn't mean head like it does in English. What it means is, literally, the, the thing that's foremost that you grab in wrestling. So in other words, when it, in Greek, when it says that God is ahead of Christ, it means that God sticks his head out to protect Christ. When it says that man, or Christ is ahead of man, it means that Christ sticks his head out to protect man. When it says that Man is the head of woman, kafela of woman. It means of his wife, specifically not woman, but gune. It says that a, a man who's a husband <coughs> puts his head out to protect his wife. It has nothing to do in Greek with being a leader. Or <coughs> There's a totally different word that would be used in Greek. So the Orthodox Jews have always taken it that the Adamic covenant did not apply to Eve. That's why, by the way, okay, where does Jewish, where does the Jewishness come from? The mother. Why? Because she knows the father. Well, not, not, not just that. That is an absolutely true thing. But, okay, think about it. So, supposedly before Adam and Eve and God pronounced, God makes the, pronounce, makes the, the covenant to both Adam and Eve. Remember that? And he said... You know, we don't know, I suspect God had it all figured out way before, right? But God does not make the statement until that point that he says that women shall de deliver babies in travail. In other words, women shall carry the baby. So God gave the right to Eve at that point to carry children and to birth children. And just like the, the verse we heard today, a woman is in pain in travail and birth, but she rejoices at the birth of the baby, because the birth of the baby is hers, and she knows it's her genes, right? And she knows it's hers. And also, that means that every baby that is born, even though it comes from the seed of Adam, is born from the pure womb of Eve. Because Eve was not held to the account of the Adamic covenant. She was then held to account with the, the covenant to Adam and Eve, right? which is not a very happy covenant. And then there's the Noahic covenant that basically says what we are, 
you know, basically two Gentiles, that's usans, and then there's the, the uh, Abrahamic covenant and, you know, each of the covenants. But the, the Orthodox Jews and, and in their, the mitzvot, the mitzvot, the women, women do not have to do certain mitzvot that men have to do. And they can do certain ones, like I mentioned before, you know, the, uh, the blessing of the light that all Jewish women do, no Jewish man can do that. They're not allowed because they are not pure because they were the ones who broke the covenant with God originally by Orthodox Judaism. Now, depending on how you feel about original sin, right, or how you, your theology or viewpoint of original sin, this is one of the reasons that they account original sin because all women and men from, a from Adam and Eve are born from Adam's seed and Eve's womb. So therefore, the seed of Adam, and by the way, that's what Jesus says, right? He doesn't say, Adam and Eve's sin. What does he say? Adam's sin. Adam's sin. So it's, it's Adam's sin, and we all take part in it. However, I think it's really funny, because they're culturally, culturally right, um, what is this? Is it a thing to blame women? Or, or, you know, that's what you always want to do is blame somebody else. Mary Eve wanted to blame somebody else, right? That's what she said. The serpent made me do it, right? And Adam, what did Adam say? The, wife you gave the me. woman you gave me made me do it, right? So it's like, okay, so this is like normal in human culture. But, but I think the Jews had it right on. And, and really what we should do, and, and we did too, right? Uh, you know that thing they call um, Victorian moralism? That we don't do that anymore, right? That women wear hats on their head. Why? Because they're crowned. Women are allowed to wear hats inside because they're crowned. Men can't because they, they are not allowed to crown be crowned with glory. That's the point. Matt Dean Paul writes about that. How about women, you know, for example... You, men used to open the doors for women. They put them on a pedestal. Well, why? We think that that was patri uh, patronizing, right? But it wasn't. It, was, it, it all has to do with how do you respect pr a person, and if you respect women as the highest peak of creation, the Jews are supposed to, although it's really funny, one of the Orthodox Jews' uh, prayers is, Thank you, God, that I was not made a, born a woman, which is really weird because the Orthodox Jews hold that women are the peak of creation. And by the way, we should too because we are teen hodos, which is just another thing. So I don't know what else you could say about it, but, you know, I've been through the covenants before. They're really interesting to, to look at within the bounds of the Torah because sometimes they're surprising to us, right? If we stick in what, we're, what we know or what we think we know, we have an interesting viewpoint. If we look at what the Jewish view, the Orthodox Jewish view, the Jewish view, the views of different churches or groups, right, then we get kind of a different worldview. Just saying. Anyway, we're still in Hebrews, and, and we're still in the faith chapter. I'd like to really get through this. The cha faith chapter is very difficult, as you see. So I have some words for you. This is our regular word, pistis. Pistis, the reason I keep putting up here is because that is the faith, right? But it's not faith. Pistis means persuasion or to be persuaded. So it has nothing to do with faith. There is no word for faith in Greek at all. Unless you want to count uh, pathos. And pathos is definitely not anything close to the faith we would conceive of. Um, this word, I, I, this is one of our words that you'll just love. I love this word. Or these types of words, tele u t o n, tele u t o n, tele u t o n. Okay, so this comes from telos, ha, telos, and tello, and of course tello is the vanishing point. Uh, let's see, draw a proper cube, or close to a cube. The vanishing point on the horizon is a telos. That's a teleo. And that's where telos comes from. And we know that all Greek writing 
is a logos to a telos. So this is teluton, is a word we'll see, tele, teleuto, teo, is basically means or ha, it means to finish life. So in other words, it's the telos of a life, or it's it's the yeah, telos of a life is probably a good way to put it. Well, how they get to that? Um, uh, We'll see it within context, you'll see what it means. But I, I'm not sure I like their... Um, you notice the King James translated it to, to be dead, decease, and die. Which is not exactly the same as finished life. I think Paul would have used... Paul did not use this word. We find it in Hebrews. I don't think we find it in many other places in the New Testament. But it's, it's specific to a, one of the, um, uh, those who were persuaded. This one also is an interesting word. D I. That's not good. Here's a good one. D I A T A G M A. Diatagama. Diatagama. Something like that. Uh, diatagma. Diatagma. From diatasso. Primary position. Okay, this means um, through. Let's see. Through. Arrange thoroughly uh, through to arrange thoroughly. So this is the tasso word. Dia means through, and this is tasso. And we've seen tasso. Remember, um, what's that one word? The one that is so classic. Um, hupitasso? What's that? Hupitasso? Yeah, hupitasso. Uh, under, to arrange thoroughly under, right? And that's one of the words where we see it says that um, that God there's a there's a whole there's a systematic thing just like Kafella where it says that that Christ is hupitasso to God just like man is hupitasso to Christ and woman is hupitasso to man to a man basically is what it says. So what's interesting about this is. We have translated hupitasso to be subordinate to, but that's not what it means at all. And it's very similar to this diatasso, diatagma. But hupitasso means, and this goes back to the Adamic covenant kind of concept, but, but just as God arranged, allowed Christ to arrange the world under his authority, and Christ allows man to arrange the world or the church under Christ's authority, that man should allow his wife to arrange the household under her authority. Totally different than the way we want to play this game, right? The reason is because in a Greek household, where were the women? They're the guy to see him. So did they have any authority? They had no authority at all except the authority the husband gave them. And what the, what the Greek and what, our, what the, the teen hodos leaders or what you know, Paul and the writers were trying to tell the men is to let your women have the authority over your house because that's their authority in, under the creation. Just like the authority of Christ that God gave him and the authority that man is given by God, by Christ, likewise Men should be given, women should be given the authority by their husbands, delegated the authority, if you like. So a totally kind of different reading. This diatasso, through, through orally arrangement, this word means an arrangement. Um, that's probably kind of weak. The King James translated it as a commandment, but we'll see this word in context also. So and it, it, anyway, <clears throat> the thing that I want to point out is, you know, some of these words... We, we like to throw, we, well, we see it all the time, right? We see these very complex Greek words, and we throw out some m meaning, and you say, well, why, why did we pick that? Well, I read, the, uh, I read that thing, Mary gave me a, that, that quote last time that was beautiful about how, you know, historically, we've kind of been set in our ways of how we translate things, right? And, of course, you've got to realize who translated it. Well, King James wanted you to pay your taxes and obey the government. 
And so did Martin Luther. Ho, ho, ho. Well, how do you think it would have been written if somebody didn't necessarily want you to pay your taxes or, well, there's nothing in the Bible that says pay your taxes, by the way, just, just to tell you. Matter of fact, Jesus says, says that uh, you should give to what Caesar what, what belongs to Caesar. What belongs to Caesar? Nothing. Nothing, Nothing. right? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, that, that, that should be an obvious slap down, but uh, I, I don't know why we misconstrue things. We have this uh, funny way of looking at the world. Anyway, let's look at, um, we are at 22. And we're looking at persuasion. All right. So the last thing we had in 21 was Jacob, Jacob, when he died off, spoke well of each of the offspring of Joseph. And the reason I point that out to you is, remember, okay, uh, I, this, is, this is our basic premise, that we, the writers of this, there are two of them, We've seen that because they use we every now and then. But two writers, and they're writing in the, dias the diaspora period after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, about 70 A.D. And we, can do, we know that. We've tried to place the time values in it. But we know there was a diaspora from Jerusalem. We have the Galil, the school of the Galil, the school of Jerusalem, the school of Babylonia, and the school of Alexandria. I don't know if I mentioned that much before. But we know that there was a huge diaspora of the Jews. And so if you wanted to write to the Hebrews, especially after diaspora, you'd be writing to them in Alexandria. Alexandria, because that's where they all went. A large number of them went. Now, there was already a large diaspora, and we know that because the New Testament documents, especially Acts, where's Paul going? He's going to the Jews within the diaspora to tell them about Christ. But what's really interesting about Alexandria, and we keep seeing this evidence over and over again. Alexandria doesn't just have Jews. It has Romans, Greeks, Jews, the Hebrews. It has um, Tinotos, which are part of this group here. And it has Egyptians. And what I want to point out to you is, here's another, the proof text we had last week, and I'll just mention again as we go into this, is that if you remember... Joseph's offspring were, they were Egyptian, his, his wife was, um, Joseph's wife was, was a Egyptian woman. So theoretically, he would not have been in the line of the, the of Jewish ascendancy, right? But Jacob blessed them. And call them his sons. So if you're writing this document to include Romans, Greeks, Hebrews, and Egyptians, well, this is why this is included. Well, I'll put to you, you figured out why, but I'll put to you that I think it's obvious that the reason this was a big deal is because they're trying to inc show inclusivity to the Egyptians, especially. And by the way, the Egyptians are inclusive in lots of this because guess what they did? You guys remember what the Egyptians did, that the Hebrews did? And the Scythians did too. The circumcision. They're, they're, the, they're, not every society circumcised their, their children, their boys. And as a matter of fact, until Islam, Islam circumcises boys. Interesting. But Islam is, you got another 600 years to go before you get to Islam. Right? Mm -hmm. So most of the cultures, the Egyptian culture, circumcised. And so did the Scythians and the Hebrews. So we don't know, well, God told Abraham to circumcise, right? But we don't know whether that, did that, was that exposure from Cynthia? Was that exposure from Egyptian ideas? Or was that totally independent? We take it that it's totally independent, right? But it is interesting, did the Egyptians get their circumcision from the children of Israel coming in? Did they get it from the Scythians? I don't know, it, it, 
this, these are huge questions, and I and I don't ask them quite, you know, biblically, we 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 think a certain way, which I think is is a correct way of thinking about it, but there are just a lot of really neat things that I think are proof texts to this whole everything that's going on, right, within this historical period. Anyway, so 22. Here is the NIV. By faith, Joseph, when he when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. So here's what it says in the in the Greek. By his added faith, peace is persuasion. Joseph, when he died, teleteo, when he finished his life, the telos of his life, made mention. Memnio to exercise the memory of Perry all through, all over, the uh, departing exodus and exit out of the way of his added, the ho children, who is offspring um, of his added Israel and in telomea, in telomea, to enjoin, and the point aimed as a limit. Um, we had in teleomai last week as a word of the day. And the reason this is an important word is because an intelos, an intelos, in is in, telos is a set telos. So it's an unchanging telos. So usually it's, that's why it's translated as a commandment as opposed to a it's, it's basically a stated telos, a stated telos, as opposed to a normal telos, which is unstated. So he gave an intelomai. He enjoined them at the point aimed to a limit concerning Perry through all over his self. It's autos. It's a uh, reflexive pronoun. Osteon, his bones. Now, what is really interesting about this is, okay, so we're talking about Joseph, right? How do you know there's going to be an exodus? Well, he did. Let, let's, here's the literal translation. It's persuaded Joseph finished life exercising memory through all over the exodus and exit out, outweigh the, the of offspring Israel and to enjoin in the point aimed as a limit through all over his self a bone. Okay, that's weird. Um, persuade, here's the translation of this. Uh, Persuaded Joseph finished life in all through the Exodus, exercised the memories of the offspring of Israel, and joined them all through his bones. Why? What did they do with his bones? They took them with them. They took them with them. We'll read that scripture too in the Old Testament. But the reason, okay, let's read the NIV again. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the Exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. Here's what the Greek clearly is a good translation, I think, says. Persuaded Joseph finished life and all through the Exodus exercised the memories of the offspring of Israel and enjoined them all through his bones. In, o- in other words, his bones were what reminded them of their time in is in Egypt and continued as a memory for their for the of the fact that he was persuaded. He was persuaded to do what? To do everything he did. Right. Right? Remember? Because he was the one that, you know, first of all he was hired as a servant and obviously he wasn't strong enough to do anything else. So he was used he did figures. He kept figures for uh, Patmos, right, or Patmos, and then then his wife tried to seduce him, and so he got thrown into prison, and so he predicted, did predictions for the king, and became, the reason he was great wasn't because of his predictions, he was great because he managed the Egypt, he managed Egypt for the whole time, right, and basically then his brothers came, so he was persuaded, basically, I would argue, he aimed for the mark and used all of his skills, right, to, to be part of the Egyptian whole thing. So all this is the, 
what do you call it, the background, right, of this very simple verse. But that was his persuasion. Persuaded, he finished his life and all the exodus, exercise, exercise the memories of the offspring of Israel and then joined them all through his bones, which is kind of different than what our NIV translation is. In any case, he enjoined through memory even though he was just a bundle of bones at that point, right? Because through that memory, they were their memory of Joseph was what? Jacob and Israel, Israel was, and Abraham were all promised, right? And so the promise was the bones, and they were going to bury his bones with his forefathers. And the only way you can do that is, you got to take him with you to the, the promised land, right? So... Um, I think this is really similar to the question, the existence of the world proves God exists. The bones of Joseph proves the history of Israel and of the Exodus. Because remember, did they have something written down? They, they had the Torah, right? No. 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 Why not? Because it hadn't been given. Not until Moses. It hadn't been given until Moses, right? Right. So they, they didn't have anything written down. All they had was the word passed down to them, right? And so those memories, evidenced by the bones of Jacob, proved a whole lot of stuff, right? Where they come from, where they've been. I, I don't know. I, I think. Yeah, but Jacob, Jacob was buried in Abraham's grave in Mamre, right? Uh huh. Yeah. In the land of Canaan. And Joseph wanted, because of Joseph's high position in Egypt, he might have been mummified and buried with something special, you know, because he was right under Pharaoh in authority. Yep. He gave him that much authority. That's right. And so he prevented that by the statement that he wanted his bones to go back to the land of Israel when he knew that there would be an exodus, that they would return to their land. And that hadn't been given them yet, but he, he trusted that promise as well. Just as his father had, and so that's why he wanted. And besides that, his kids were not pure Israel; they were half Egyptian and half um, and half Israeli. And so, what he wanted to do was to say, "I am a son. I'm part of the family. My kids are part of the family." Mm -hmm. And and so that's that was. I think that was the importance of of. Uh, I want my bones to go with you. I think, I think it's really tied into all of that. And what's very interesting, and we don't know, okay, the nomadic tribes, okay, tended to do stuff like uh, very classically, right? What they do is when you die, many times they'll put your body out until there's just bones. You know, pick, pick by the crows, whatever. The... That was very common for nomadic people, and then they would either take the bones around or they put them in a communal tomb. And by the way, what did they do? What was done in the first century? The first century, they would put you in a, in a tomb. Well, they start with a tomb until your, your body had been eroded away, right? And then they would put you in an ossuary, os uh, os you know, a, a thing to carry just your bones, now, in Jesus' time, they would wrap the body in myrrh and with wrappings, right? Until the bones, until it completely, you know, was bones, and they'd put them away. Where do you think they got that from? Egyptians. Probably Egyptians. From the Egyptians, yeah, yeah. Now, this is a, this interesting question, okay? If we read the Hebrew... The Hebrew is, or the Greek, the Greek is very concrete. And, when, and it says specifically bones, and the Septuagint says bones. But the word bones in Hebrew isn't that simple of a word. It has multiple meanings. The word bone in Hebrew could mean that I'm carrying a mummy. In other words, the container for the bones is a body, right? You could say, my, my body is my bone container. So if I mummified me, 
and you carried me. Now, I'd be relatively lightweight and pretty easy to carry, not quite as easy as a bundle of bones, I guess. But do you see my point? It, it's not super clear, although I'm a thinking that what happened was when they went from, obviously, the Hebrews picked up a lot of stuff from the Egyptians, right? How to write, how to make brick work, whether that's good or bad, how to do stonework. Language, all these things came from Egypt, including a lot of their embalming and how they treated the bodies, because we see that in the first century. Now, I suspect they weren't doing bodies like the Egyptians were, because their whole philosophy of life was different, right? right. But I just want to throw it out there, because there is... Um, it doesn't matter really whether you whether you say well he was a mummy or he wasn't a mummy you know when he went over but his I, I believe and, and I'm thinking right that Jacob was mummified right when they carry his body he was prepared it says although I, I didn't <coughs> grab that um, and like I said you know that the Hebrews are euphemistic enough where the Greek is very concrete so either way you want to go with it I, we can take that in any case um, the reason I mention this is because if, if you have a mummy, and what do they do with mummies? Especially in the later period. They put a portrait on, right? Even in the pharaoh periods, they would, they would put a picture or a, a face on them, right? A mask. It'd be your mask. It, it's supposed to look like you, although it's stylized, because they didn't, couldn't do three dimensions very well. So. If, let's say, I'm carrying a bundle of bones. I mean, a bundle of bones, to us, us and we're English speakers, and so, I mean, that's simple enough, right? Here's bones. But just think if I had a mummy with a face of Joseph on it. And he's going, right? You're carrying him. What does that do? It's a reminder of work, certainly. Yeah, it's a constant reminder, not just a constant reminder of bones, but his face, you know, his, his face, his figure, his everything. And so it doesn't say anyone else was brought that way, but just that his bones, right, he was brought that way. So whether it was a bundle of bones carried, you know, some way in a pack, I don't know, or it, it was, you know, a mummified, which you know, would be very lightweight and easy to carry pretty much because of the way they prepared it, it doesn't matter. The point was... They're bringing him back. I just, want to, I just want you to see the picture, right? Because a picture, God gives us pictures. This is theological, all right. Uh, God gives us pictures, right? A picture of Christ's death on the cross, the Eucharist. We take the body and the blood, right? It's a picture. It's real, but it's a picture of the heavenly things. It's a symbol of the he heavenly things. So I, I think God is very smart about this. He gives us these beautiful pictures and this picture that the Israelites had by, by going across there. In any case, uh, Genesis 50, 24 to 25 in Exodus, this, this is where we, um, let's see, uh, 24, I'm not going to read the whole, let's see, I'll start with the first thing, and it's, uh, Joseph, we already had some of this. Um, yeah, uh, chapter 50, 51 Joseph threw himself upon his father and wept over him and kissed him. Then Joseph directed the physicians in his service to embalm his father Israel. So the physicians embalmed him. And taking full 40 days, time required for embalming, Egyptians mourned for him for 70 days. Time of mourning passed, so uh, yeah, I, I was remembering right. So um, when he took Israel back, he was embalmed like a mummy. So we might even find that mummy someday you know, in, in Israel, which would be really cool. Uh, but as we go down to 20, at 24, then Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he predicted the Exodus. The NIV gives us that picture, but I don't think that's a great translation of what the point is. And Joseph made the sons of Israel swear an oath, and he said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. And as I said, in Hebrew, that's kind of a, uh, you know, 
a euphemistic term in itself. So Joseph died at the age of 110, and after they embalmed him, he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So he was embalmed like a mummy. Okay, and then in 13, let's see, um, 18, so God led the people around the desert road toward the Red Sea, and the Israelites went out of Egypt armed for battle. In 19, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. Okay, if they did a cheap mummy job, he may have just been bones at that time, uh, you know, but I, do you think they did a cheap mummy job? No. No, he was number two under Pharaoh, right? This guy, as a matter of fact, what's that? He got the royal treatment. So he better have been a good one, right? Because otherwise the warranty is full out. Now, depending on, it was like about 400 years that they spent in, in Egypt, depending on which, you know, source. I just, I just looked it up, 430 years. There you go. So, so the mummies come with a longer warranty than that. Tutankhamun lasted like 2,000 years, right? So I'm just saying, so 400 years is a pretty short warranty on that one. In any case, I, I just wanted you to see that picture because I think the picture is beautiful, right, of them. And, and matter of fact, they ought to do that, right, in a movie. If they had a movie of them carrying a mummy, and that's Joseph, right, but probably what we'd get is somebody carrying the bones. Like, well, that's kind of weird. Anyway, 23, so we're finally to Moses. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Okay? Here it is in Greek. By his added faith, peace, this persuasion, Moses, when he was born, Geneo, to procreate, was hid, crup, crupto, to conceal by covering, three months, tremium, uh, of, hupto, under, his, autos, it's his self, parents, pater, it's not parents, it's pater, it's father, because, because, dote, on the very account that they saw to see, idio, he was added, uh, it's not a, it's the proper uh, astios, urbane child, pedon, a childling. Uh, that's an interesting word to use, the astios, urbane, childling. And chi, they were as added but implied, not, not phobio uh, of uh, of is implied, the king's uh, hold, bacillus, a sovereign's commandment, diatagma, an arrangement. Now, there's really interesting words used in this. Very interesting words. Here's the, here's the literal. Persuaded Moses procreated, was concealed by covering three months under his self-father on the very account that saw the urbane childling and not frightened of the sovereign's arrangement. So here's a translation. Persuaded Moses, procreated, was concealed under cover three months by his father on the very account that his father saw the child was handsome, and he was not frightened of the sovereign's arrangements. There's two really interesting things in this. Number one, the writer used the word bacillus. Bacillus. Why would he use the word bacillus? Bacillus is translated royalty or king. Why use that word? Why not use what word? The Egyptian word for king. Pharaoh. Why not use the word Pharaoh? Pharaoh is a Greek, is a Greek uh, you know, word. Why not? Well, what if he didn't necessarily want to offend the Egyptians? Because what do they have right now? An emperor king, right? Actually, they have a procurator um, who's overseeing their nation. And remember, this, this is, uh, this is, well, let's see, Mark Anthony and Caesar, that was just before this, and Cleopatra is right coming into this period. But they're Greek. Egyptians are Greek, right? They're, they were under Greek empire for over 300 years. They're Greek, big time Greek. And Greeks had kings, and they had had kings, 
and now they're under emperor. But if I use the word king, well, that's a safe word. That's a really good safe word, right? So if I, if I use Pharaoh, though, I don't know. I think it's interesting to use that word, uh, especially if you want to be happy. Um, procreate was concealed. It's interesting he was concealed by his father because the child was handsome. Boy, you know, it's, it's a sad thing that all children look like Winston Churchill, right? I guess Moses looked better than Winston Churchill. Um, I, it's interesting the word urbane because uh, <clears throat> urbane childing is, is a phraseology in Greek for a good-looking child. So in any case, that's interesting. It's also interesting that he was not frightened of the sovereigns. And the word that's used is uh, diatagma. Diatagma. What word would you have used? In tolus, a commandment, right? We just had a word, a commandment. So the author knows this word. It has this word. This is a common word. And before he used it for a commandment, because that was a commandment that Joseph made, that they, he commanded him to carry his bones. So why... Wasn't this a commandment? It's an arrangement, not a commandment. It's an orderly arrangement. I think it's an interesting word. Um, I think the authors, there's two things going on here. Number one, the authors do not want to call an immoral commandment a commandment and then tell us. Yes, sir. They're not recognizing the authority of the, the order. They're not uh, recognizing the authority of a king. Because it's teen hodos. And who is their authority? Jesus. Jesus. What I want to point you back to, and this is, we'll see this more and more. We've seen it before. The purpose of the persuaded chapter isn't necessarily the persuaded. They're important. But the reason they're important is because they were persuaded so that Christ would be the end factor. That's the importance. And so the importance of everything is Christ. And I think we see these, you know, I, they're not, I don't think they're indicators. They're, they would be obvious. They would be obvious, right? If I use the word in tole to be a commandment in a, in a statement just prior to this, as a, as a reader, you would expect to see in tole when you're talking about the king's commandments, unless you didn't respect the king's commandments. Or you're not necessarily trying to tell the people not to follow the correct laws of the king. But what was the law of the king? Well, what did the pharaoh tell them to do? Kill their male children. Kill the male babies, right? And told the midwives to do that. And th what a tricky way to do it. You get the Hebrew midwives, right? It it's not like you have Egyptians going around killing them. It's the Hebrew midwives. That's horrific, right? Get the, get the so-called good guys to do your evil acts. So, diatasso, diatasso instead of intole. And then totally is a, is, a reason, is a commandment that's law, um, you call it a, a legal, in the military, you have legal orders and illegal orders. A, a uh, illegal order might be a diatasso, where a legal order would be an intelis. I was just thinking of an arrangement, sounds more like a, a legal or business kind of deal, like somebody's done a contract to see that something gets carried out, even though it's not, it's not an order, like a... From a position of authority, it's, it's more like a, a contractual deal or something like that. It's like. Yeah, and, and what it also allows you to do is, okay, like I said, if you're trying to make the Egyptians happy, what would make the Egyptians really unhappy? Pharaoh told them to kill the Hebrew children. What would you feel? That makes me feel bad. But if you say that the king, Basilus, made an arrangement to harm the Hebrew children, 
right? Then, then that's a di that's a kind of a different thing, right? It's like he's going under. It's like he's not doing it legally, right? He's doing it in a tricky manner, which, like I said, it is a tricky manner. You had the midwives do it. I mean, you know, an, an untricky manner is the way. Uh, um, what's his name? Uh, Augustus, Herod, right? Herod said, "Kill the children." I'm sending my troops, and I guarantee you didn't send Roman soldiers. What did the Roman soldiers do when they found the Tophet in, uh, you know what a Tophet is, right? A Tophet? A Tophet is where you, where you, um, you do, you sacrifice children, infanticide. The, the Phoenicians, um, Phoenicians, Phoenicians, the Philistines, Philistines, Phoenicians, there are a, a lot of the guys, uh, groups did that. And the Carthaginians were originally Phoenicians. And there are two known Tophets in the world. One of the Tophets is in Carthage. Carthage. The other one's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Two Tophets, two places for infant sacrifice. When the Roman soldiers came to Carthage, what did they find? A Tophet. They were so irritated that they that they basically broke the entire city down and salted it. And historians tell us, and I don't remember which historian specifically, but one of the historians about that. Uh, about the, uh, third, the Third Carthaginian War, what they call it? The, um, anyway, the Third Carthaginian War that they fought. Remember, the second one was when they carried the guys over the Alps, you know, with the, the, the third one was when they were ultimately defeated. So it shows you should always completely defeat your enemies, you know, don't let them keep cropping back. But they were so irritated by the top that they found that they, they destroyed the city, completely decimated the city. They had, they had soundly defeated Carthage on the battlefield. Yeah. But they, at great personal cost, they sacked the city and destroyed it so, because of that. So I'm saying, what I'm telling you is, I guarantee you that Herod did not send legionnaires to do that job. Because we know where the legionnaires, uh, it's interesting to see that the legionnaires, you know, we always picture them as, as pretty ruthless groups, right? But the fact they were so incised that they destroyed Carthage because of a top fit. Very what, interesting. What year is this all happen? Oh, I, I don't remember offhand. I'm sorry. I, I think it was sometime BC. Um, it was the last Carthaginian War. Someone, yeah, we can look Google, right? This pastor was saying today. In, he'll so find who it. would he have sent? What's that? Who would he have sent? Oh, his own troops. Because he had authority. Um, matter of fact, he ha although he had some uh, legion, he did not have, he had a legion he could call upon. And in my book, I write about the fact that there was a legion, there was uh, at least two um, uh, the larger groups of the centuries, uh, anyway, that were in, the, in that area. We know there's probably, you know, part of a legion there, but he would have not have called upon the legion. Maybe he would have liked it, but he probably couldn't. So he would have called on his own troops. And we see that in the New Testament, right? Because remember, he, sold, he sent his troops to, to get John the Baptist, right? So Herod had authority and troops. Um, obviously not as trained as legionnaires. Yes, Where is it? Topfit? Is that the word you're using? Uh, Topfit. How do you spell that? Um, T-O-P-H-E-T. -E Where is it in Jerusalem? It's uh, in Gehenna. In, the, in Jerusalem, you have, uh, let's see, you have the, I haven't done Jerusalem in a long time, but you have, there is, there is a small river or stream that's, um, I can't remember what it's called, the one that's in the south part of Jerusalem? The, what's that? Kidron Valley. The, well, the Kidron Valley. It's where the dump is. It's where the dump is, yeah. The Kidron Valley yeah. and Gehenna. Gehenna, yeah. what, but there's a name for that river or that stream. Yeah, I it was the Kidron Brook, but I don't know. The Kidron, whatever. Anyway, it's the Kidron, Kidron, south of the, there's the wall of Jerusalem, and this is where they, there was the, um, refuse gate, and that's where they bring the refuse into the Kindred Valley. Into it's literally called Gehenna, um, which translates also in Hebrew to be like hell, right? But there's a lot of cool associate cool associations, well, horrible associations, because it's a real place. But there was a topic. This is where we believe the topic was, 
And historically, we have evidence. Mary, I don't know, you have to look it up, but archaeological evidence of where the top, top of it was. Yes, sir. Third Punic War, 148 BC. 148 BC, yep. Punic War. That's what I was looking for, the first, second, and third Punic War. Yeah, three wars against those guys. Um, in Exodus 1, um, 16, let's see. Um, the king of Egypt said, and it's interesting, it says, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Sephar and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, and let the boys live. So that's an interesting one. And then chapter, let's see, in, chapter, in 22, the Pharaoh gave his order to all the people, every boy that is born you must throw into the Nile, but every, let every girl live. And chapter 2, now a man in the house of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When he saw that he was a fine child, an urbane child, she, she hid him for three months. It's interesting that the Hebrews says that the father hid him. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket, so she put him in the knot. Very interesting that she put him in the Nile. As she followed the rules. She followed the rules. Um, the Nile, just in the boat. Moses means, uh, what is the word? Oh, I got it in one of my books. Um, the draw, well, it, it, it's the name of a god. It, it's it's a name. Um, what's that? It, oh, sorry. It's a, it's the name of a god. Moses. And, and the actual name of Moses is in Greek doc or not Greek in in uh, Egyptian documents, and I can't remember what the total name is, but it's it's like a uh, Hapa Moses, Hapa Moses, because Hapa is the god of the Nile, and it's the Hapa pull from the Nile. In other words, his name is a god. That's why he shortened his name, um, at least that we have, you know, right? Now let's see. Let's go to 24. My notes, my notes, my notes. Twenty more. Here's the NIV. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Here's the Greek. By is added faith, peace, dis persuasion. Moses, when he was come up to years, geonomai, uh, gia, it's, it's a Greek phrase, geonomai megas, to cause to be big, when he, when he was caused to be big, refused, er neomai, he to contradict, to be called Lego, to argue, to Lego. The the son, uh, see, the is added, Huios, offspring of Pharaoh. And here they use Pharaoh. Here they use Pharaoh. Daughter. Thirdicur, a female child, basically a daughter. So literally, persuaded Moses when he became big, contradicted arguments, offspring Pharaoh's daughter. And Translation, persuaded Moses, when he became big, contradicted arguments that he was the offspring of Pharaoh's daughter. Um, you know, the translation isn't bad, but what I, what I really like about this is, NIV says, by faith, and King James is pretty close, by faith, when he had grown up, refused to be known as son of Pharaoh's daughter. But what the Greek says is, persuaded Moses, when he became big, contradicted arguments that he was the offspring of Pharaoh's daughter. You see the difference? One is active and the other is passive. In other words, you know, one is, I go up to you and I say, you know, no, I, there's no way I was Pharaoh's, you know, I, I'm, I'm not Pharaoh's, you know, even though I'm wearing, what was he wearing? His Pharaoh suit. Yeah, he's got his Pharaoh suit because literally, do you remember who they said that the, the, the Pharaoh that during the Exodus, he was the uncle of Hapa Moses, of Moses. He's the uncle of Moses. The Pharaoh at the time was was known as the as the uncle of Moses. Now I would have said Moses should have used some of his uh, you know, I mean, maybe he was going through a phase, right? <laughs> You didn't even run away, right? But, but just think what kind of power you could have had to help your own people, right? Moses, 
in some ways, is almost like a Paulian figure, right? Paul irritated everybody. Some of his irritation was good, but a lot of his irritation was just bad because they beat him and kicked him out of places. And he had to leave what Mark and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Barnabas. Barnabas to clean up the mess, right? Every time he get kicked out, he got beat up, kicked out, and Paul and Barnabas stayed behind and cleaned it up. And then Paul went to the next city where he started to cause problems, started a fire, right? Well, Moses, you know, was causing problems up to the point where he eventually he killed, right, an Egyptian overseer. And, and by the way, under their law, well, that's interesting. We don't get a whole lot into this. I mean, that's, that's what we're looking at in the Torah. But it says in Exodus 2, um, Pharaoh's daughter, let's see. So it's really funny. Um, uh, five. Pharaoh's daughter went down the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw a basket among the reeds and sent her slave girl to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. How did you know? Circumcision. Circumcision. Yeah, but they circumcised the, the Egyptian circumcised boys. Yeah, it was wrapped in a... Could, could be. I, you know, it could have been the smoothie anyway. <laughs> well, it, it could have been the clothing. It could have been the style of the of the basket. You know, the basket weaving or whatever. There's this is really interesting. It could have been uh, I don't know. You know why? There wouldn't be any writing, right? Like a note, right? Anyway, she opened it and saw a baby. He was crying. He felt sorry. It's one of the Hebrew babies. She said. Then his sister. Ask Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go. And she got the baby's mother. I mean, what a cool setup. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take the baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. Now, okay, the child grew older, and she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She called him Moses, actually Hapa Moses, in, in Egyptian, saying, I drew him out of the water. He's named after the god of the Nile. Now, the thing that's very interesting about this, though, is how, what's the only way that Pharaoh's daughter can play this game? Oh no. Claim it's a child of the deity. Right? I, I, okay. My dad's Pharaoh. I'm Pharaoh's daughter, right? Now in that period, Pharaoh was not viewed as God, okay? Or, or a God thing. But he was and he wasn't even viewed as the head of the Egyptian, whatever, you know, their religious whole thing. But the only way you're going to get away with this is you go to Father Pharaoh and say, Hey, Dad, the God of the Nile gave me a child. Right? I mean, this is the way you play that game. Otherwise, what happens? Pharaoh goes, Yeah! It's like, you know, I already did this. I already did this edict, right? The Atasso. Anyway, I, I mean, this this is really deep stuff. It's every one of these statements is deep into the history and to inf information. Anyway, Father God, we thank you for this day. We pray you look after us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.